Oh, I don't hear anything in there. Okay, we're coming up remote one uh, sound and picture. Two. We're going to Sony one sound. For a minute, ten to the ID. Telesync yeah. is dead then, evidently. No, oh, Telesync's okay it's with coming me. On. It's coming on. Wes and Monica, no frickin' frack with Miller. No frickin' frack with Miller. And, he, I was gonna say, and he just told me that his wife was pregnant. 30 seconds to the ID. 30. Stan Miller by in the newsroom. Oh. 30 seconds to ID. Okay. We specify express mail next day service. They deliver. 10 seconds to the ID. 10 to the ID. ID six. Stand by. Up remote one, Q, Q Miller. Ready Sony one sound. Roll Sony one. Hold. One of the fastest growing crimes in Atlanta. Roll VTC two. Key. Ready Q over camera three. Your first time to open. Monica leave the show. Key over camera three. Dissolve camera three. Ready camera two. Take two. Q. Good evening. The audit of Mara has been made public. You have just gotten a peek behind the scenes, beneath the surface, at the final minute before Action News goes on the air. Chances are what you see of Action News is what comes on your television set. But there are more than 50 people working from before dawn till well after sundown putting on three newscasts a day, seven days a week. Now, understand the same thing goes on at Channel 5 and Channel 11 in New York City and Bellingham, Washington. It is energy and imagination and frustration and chaos. And it actually starts the day before at the 5.30 meeting. What's the second? The 5.30 meeting is the newsroom's equivalent of a Mediterranean bazaar. The merchants assemble in an atmosphere of controlled confusion to barter to buy, to sell. Here, members of the newsroom gather to trade ideas for stories to do for the next day. At the meeting this particular evening, Dick Mallory, news director, the boss. Dick Bird, the executive producer, the number two man. Dave Clark, in charge of the 11 o'clock news. Dennis Kauf, usually a reporter, for the next few weeks, the assignment editor, the person responsible for getting the day started, deciding on stories, and getting those stories covered. <laughs> My midway rise is going to be Wes. Dog napping is going to be BB. Martyr development is going to be Miller. Um, drought forests. You checked that out and decided it wasn't anything to do now? And then there are the reporters, the people sent to cover the stories. The 5.30 meeting is a place to kick around ideas for the next day. Most of the ideas remain intact for the next day. At this meeting, I discussed the phone call I had gotten with BB Emmerman. The story was about dog napping, and I told Bibi what I knew and which people had been contacted. The rest was up to her. It is the assignment editor who is the focal point of the 5.30 meeting, lining up the stories he has and the new ones he gets and getting an idea of what the day is going to look like. The next day and every day starts early for the assignment editor, about 7.30. Two people are already at work. Producer Chuck Baker in charge of the new news and Jocelyn Dorsey, who does the 725, the 825, and noon news, and is also a reporter. On this morning, Dennis would have liked to have eased into his day and spent a little more time skimming the morning paper, but he cannot. Three things have happened before he arrived. A truck turned over on the downtown connector, a truck and a bus collided at Roberts Road and I-75, and a Delta jet has been hijacked to Cuba. Of course, these things are important, but let's keep things in perspective. First things first, everybody wants some coffee. Yeah. Coffee, the opiate of the newsroom. There is little doubt that the newsroom single-handedly supports the coffee industry. With coffee in hand, Kauf seeks out chief photographer Dave Mobley. Mobley was in at 6 in the morning to cover the accident on I-75. There were some problems. Uh, well, my back focus went out. <laughs> so, uh, this camera's out of service until Blake can look at it. Either you are willing to bend to adjust or you're going to break. There are enough curveballs thrown at you during the course of a normal day to drive you crazy if you are not ready for them. Finicky equipment is just one problem. It has been a busy morning. It is not yet 9 o'clock. The bulk of the news staff just starts coming in. Reporter Hank Phillippe is working on a series about physical therapy. V.B. Emmerman comes in. She will be working on the dog napping story. But it is Terry Anzer that assignment editor Kalf is looking for. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Terry is given the top story of the day, the hijacking. 
The plane will not be coming back to Atlanta this day, so Terry will have to come up with a different angle. But I think what we got to do at this angle, and ABC also wants to be kept, in, kept abreast of this, is something with the FAA on what they're doing to keep gasoline bottles and things of that sort from right. being put on airplanes. The give and take at the assignment desk continues, and this is the time of day when the reporter's best friend gets a workout, the telephone. You know what I mean? Like, what I need is, like, graphic stuff. She had, did she have the same kind of dog that you did? Well, yeah, we're trying to put it together for the 6 o'clock news, so the sooner the better. Because um, I know that it was already done before, but we need it for the noon news. And, I, and if I'm not here, just ask for Chuck Baker. He's the producer. It is not yet 9.30, more than eight and a half hours before the 6 o'clock news. Even so, the assignment editor knows there are enough stories to fill the newscast and more. But his concern now is getting his people prepared and out the door, for he is also a dispatcher as well as an idea man. Dan, oh, you're going to so be with Don uh, this morning, all right? All right. Okay, word is so you're going to go with Bob? Yes, sir. Okay. While Terry Anzer has to wrestle with the hijacking story, with her coffee by her side, B.B. Emmerman is getting ready to go out on her dog napping story. It is 10 o'clock. All right, we're going. We'll see you later. So much has already happened in the newsroom, and still the day is just beginning, especially for the reporters. All right, this is a story about dog napping. Actually, this is a story about how B.B. Emmerman and photographer Clarence Gordon cover a story about dog napping. You will find that before the reporter can clearly communicate to you, the viewer, the reporter and the photographer have to clearly communicate with each other. What I envision doing with this is um, getting a little bit of natural sound of the, the meeting. When we're, when we're done, we can go back to his house, get a shot of the other dog that's still left. This is a situation different from any other in all of journalism, different from radio, different from newspapers. In television, there is always a crew, in this case, a reporter and a photographer. One is for the words and one for the pictures. You don't have a story if either is missing, and you don't have a good story if they don't work together. Now, I could be completely uh, wrong, but... You could be, but then you could be completely right. That's true. I would say I have a 50-50 chance. Yeah. From the information she collected at the 5.30 meeting the night before, Bibi has set up an interview at a condominium in Vinings. Three people are there who suspect their dogs have been kidnapped. An Atlanta police detective is also there. He has been investigating the dog napping ring. He does not want his face shown. That presents a bit of a problem for Clarence and Beebe. All right, well, the problem now we got to deal with is keeping Cox out of the shot. Right. And all together. Right. Well, you can, you can shoot the back of his head, side of his face, you know, just so he's not really identifiable. The crew resolves that problem and reassures the detective and then begins preparing for the interview. You don't just get out of the truck and begin the interview. There is equipment to arrange and lights. After a lengthy discussion prior to the interview, at which time everybody gets an idea of what's going to happen, then the interview begins. I think we're ready to go. So why doesn't everybody just go ahead and I will be out of the, pretend I'm not here. BB may want to be invisible to these people, but Clarence needs to see her. They are constantly talking with each other to make sure each is doing what the other wants. And then after more than an hour, the interview, which probably will not take more than 30 seconds during the story, is over. B.B. and Clarence pack up and leave, all the while plotting their strategy for the rest of the story. The thing is, we don't need that many shots of people walking their dogs. Just, you know, one or two would really do it. Remember that while B.B. and the rest of the reporters are out there covering stories, the staff at the station is trying to put a newscast together. There is an ever so slight tether that binds crew to newsroom in the form of a two-way radio. Is the Go ahead, ENG4. Yeah, Daz, you just wanted to let you know that we're done with the interviews and we're heading on to shoot a more couple of general dog shots and then we'll be in. We'll let you know when we're done. Okay, thank you. Kaylee, 457, clear. G4, clear. There is another interview at the house of the young couple. The companion of the dog feared stolen becomes the centerpiece of the interview, and BB runs into a problem of a slightly unusual nature. I stepped in a red ant pile. I need combat pay for this. Ouch! Oh. They still ridden. I wanted the exciting life of a television reporter. <laughs> and now BB and Clarence are ready to wrap up the story. But what looks so easy on the air comes only with practice. I'm talking about, unfortunately, though, it's uh, even though dog napping is a felony, dog nappers are almost impossible to catch. But sadly. Even though dog napping is a felony, dog nappers are almost impossible to catch. 
But sadly enough, even though dog napping is considered to be a felony, dog nappers are almost impossible to catch. But sadly enough, even though dog napping is considered to be a felony, dog nappers are almost impossible to catch. But sadly enough, even though dog napping is a felony, dog nappers are almost impossible to catch. But sadly enough, even though dog napping is considered to be a felony, dog nappers are almost impossible to catch. And when they are caught, the crime is almost impossible to prove. In fact, there has never been a single case of dog napping that's ever come to trial in Fulton County. It is now 12.30. Bebe and Clarence have finished. And once again, that imaginary tether starts tugging. Staff, we got it, and we're heading in. Okay, thank you. We'll see you later. CNG Corps clear. There is no question that what BB and Clarence do every day is important, but there is no way any of it gets on the air without the people working in the newsroom. Terry! His entrance is without fanfare. Other things with higher priorities are happening, and he is content to ease into the day. For when it is time for him to gear up, he will have no rest. His name is Tom Moo, and he is the producer for the 6 o'clock okay, newscast. What about four minutes fat man? Four fat? Good. <laughs> As if a couple of things we're working on fall through. If the assignment editor is responsible for finding the stories to cover and getting them covered, the producer is responsible for deciding in which order they will run on the news. Moo finds out from Dennis Kauf about the story that B.B. Emmerman is doing. People uh, ripping off pedigree dogs and then selling them to uh, auctions and things of that sort. There is some concern about the top story of the day, the story on security at the airport in light of the morning's hijacking from Atlanta to Havana. Terry Anzer will have to rely on material provided by a television station in Miami. The guesswork, the plotting, the mental gymnastics begin. If we don't get that, that video from Miami or from Charleston, we don't have any video of the hijacked plane. Okay. Jocelyn Dorsey and producer Chuck Baker are preparing the new news. Technician Tony Light motors in. Reporter Lynn Harrison and photographer Bill Jordan bring in an early story. They go to one of the electronic editing booths where they can look at what they've shot and begin to put it together. Any way we can wire the uh, audio off and get it? We have a button breakdown. Right there is a tension that is building. It is always present as long as there is an element of unknown about how the 6 o'clock news is going to look. It is a positive tension. It gets the juices flowing, but it is tension nonetheless. Even in the midst of all this tension, however, members of the newsroom do not lose sight of perhaps the most important event of their day next to the news itself. Steak and cheese with mushrooms. You order wings, you order wings. Big order wings. Whoa! Yes. Lunch. Production assistant Cynthia Swan takes orders and money and journeys out to get chicken wings. Of course, some can't wait for her to get back. Producer Tom Moo keeps in touch with the crews in the field to find out how they are doing and whether they have any special problems or requests. You're in two cars, right? Yeah, she's got a 1.30 uh, be there assignment at the rehab center. And the staff in the newsroom keeps a constant eye on the wire machines, machines that automatically type out the day's events. Bulletin, bulletin. Uh, I wish this would type faster. It drives me crazy. Buenos Aires, Argentina. Yeah. A coup. Yeah. Military coup. Oh, I bet an embassy has been taken over. Somoza was assassinated. Who? Somoza. It is time for Moo to put his day into some kind of formal order. News director Dick Mallory issues invitations to the 2 o'clock meeting. It's 2 o'clock. You know where your stories are? Yeah, you know where your stories are. Assignment editor Kauf and executive producer Dick Bird join Mallory and Moo. This is the opportunity for Moo to tell the staff what his show is looking like. Meeting with the hijacking, Terry's package, coming behind with Lynn's package on uh, the construction cleanup. We're leading the 30s with the dog napping uh, story, BB's piece. And this is the opportunity for the staff to make suggestions, to flip-flop stories, to rearrange more mental gymnastics. Right, but if the audit, I'm saying if the audit, audit becomes as big as it might, then we can flip up the whole sale. Yeah. The meeting breaks up, the tension increases, the chicken wings arrive, and Tom Moo puts on paper what his 6 o'clock newscast is going to look like. He types a format, an outline, a road map, which the staff can use to guide them toward the newscast. Yeah. Having a 6 o'clock newscast on paper is one thing. Actually putting it together is another.
Then you take it wherever you want. Goodbye, sir. Marla. Answer! Lynn Harrison. Hey, Dennis. Line two. You're mumbling again, Dan. BB, you have a call on line one. BB, line one. Tim Brewer, line one. Tim Brewer, you have a call on line one. Boy, I wish the phone was <laughs> It is 3.30, and an undercurrent of chaos flows through the newsroom. Though most of the reporters are back and most of the stories for the 6 o'clock news have been decided on, there is enough uncertainty to cause some shooting from the hip. It's not going to be out until 5.20, so we're keeping it simple at 6 o'clock. Page 3, guys. B.B. Emmerman tells producer Tom Moo what kind of a story she has and how long it will be. Moo then decides where in his show the story will fit. But decisions are made to be broken, especially when late stories develop, like the one Paul Miller brings back from a Marta meeting. Okay, I'll work on that, and we'll, we're going to move it to the top of the show. Terry Anzer's story on the hijacking from Atlanta to Cuba is also late in coming together. Uh, Executive producer Dick Bird and Anzer plot last-minute strategy. He says pour liquid apparently gasoline. But he says in the soundbite. Oh, no, I'm going to have to change Cynthia. the whole story. Bird has shifted into his role as the smiling hatchet man. Sometimes he merely talks with the reporter to suggest a way to handle a story. Take, take, so you can take a look at her last lines and try to play off of that. Not using the broomstick idea, but using the uh, a direct playoff. Let's be more direct with it. And sometimes, as the look on Beebe's face should tell you, he wields his axe and forces reporters to cut valuable seconds from their stories to make them fit the time allotted. It's too long. Cut it down. Cut that sound bite down. Cut this That's down. That's why they tell it works. The action shifts from the typewriters. <laughs> to the editing booths. Terry Anzer now has material of the morning's hijacking shipped from Miami. She and editor Michael Palillo look at what they have and decide how they want to put it together. I think uh, we'll just use that map and I'll make an edit between them. What I was trying to do through that map is show the contrast of what they were supposed to do and what they ended up doing. Okay. Phoebe Emmerman and Connie Stone are in another editing booth. They are working on the dog napping story. They were heartbroken. Let's just stick with that. Yeah, and then just, just, just go to the interview. Yeah. Film comes out of the processor and is brought into the film editing room. Here the film is literally cut and glued. Reporters rush to finish their scripts so that they can record a voice track, the reporter's voice to be matched with the pictures. Three, two, one. For a billboard to be what DOT officials... Lou Davis records his commentary for the 11 o'clock news. Johnny Beckman gets his weather map ready. Sports producer Bob Giordano and sports reporter John Buren discuss the sports segment. And now you need your double line there. Double line. Yeah, ends plus pad. Director George Murphy comes into the newsroom. He is in charge of putting the newscast on the air, what you see and what you hear. Moo plugs him into what's going on. On three, um, remote, huh? And on the, um, on the Falcon Flyer that we killed out of 21. It is just after 5 o'clock. It is rush hour in the newsroom. Some things are going well. All right. And some things are not going well. I have too much rewriting in here. Okay. This is crazy. All right. Producer Moo makes the rounds to see where things stand and who's in trouble. He learns a disturbing fact. There is too much material in his show. This turkey's going to fly about three minutes longer than it's supposed to. The turkey is fat, but will it fly? A million dollar a year business, dog napping. B.B. Emmerman explains. It was the 13th successful hijacking of a commercial airliner this year. Most of them blamed on homesick Cuban refugees. Terry Anzer has the story. The efforts of the entire day have pointed to what is about to happen. Producer Tom Moo collects all the stories written to this point and puts them in order. Wes Sargentson and Monica Kaufman read through their scripts. And then director George Murphy makes his move to the control room. Paul Miller's going to be up here, top of the show. And then Wes and Monica make their move to the studio. And at 6 o'clock, ready or not, the newscast begins. Key over camera three, dissolve camera three, ready camera two, take two, cue. A television newscast is like the dog paddle, calm on the surface, but below kicking like crazy to stay afloat. While Wes and Monica are on the air, the editors are still working to finish up late stories. 
And sometimes it is a race with the clock to get the stories ready. George, a reporter that came in that was really pre-31, and it was marked on the script for a West read. It's a Monica read. Like pilots of an airliner, producer Moo and director Murphy are strapped in for the ride. And though there is a script to follow, it is constantly changing. The script says it's 4B, but it's marked wrong. The yellow said 4B. It's really 4A. Every change has to be passed on to the people who read the news, the anchors, as they are called, Wes and Monica. That, um, that page that came down, Falcon Flyer, that's a pre-31, and it's a Monica read, not a Wes read. During the newscast, the anchors try to stay as loose as possible without losing their concentration. Sometimes the conversation after stories continues while the commercial is running. Now here's a guy yesterday, or on Monday rather, that tries to jump over a fountain and daggone near kills himself for 350000 Back in the control room, Moo and Murphy can't afford to relax. There's just too much going on. Paul Miller has just finished his report from upstairs in the newsroom. The fleet apparently agrees with the conclusions of this one. Clear. <sighs> a little more than 10 minutes into the hour, up comes page 30, B.B. Emmerman's dog napping story, a story that took her more than two and a half hours to cover. The story runs two minutes and 19 seconds. Or they sell the stolen dogs at out-of-state flea markets. No pun intended. But Key. even though dog napping is considered to be a felony, dog nappers yeah. are almost impossible to catch. Both Moo and Murphy keep a close eye on time. The newscast cannot go one second more than an hour, or it will cut into the network newscast that follows. We're running real tight as dead, and we can't be fooling around. After some early turbulence, this flight has smoothed out, as Johnny Beckman gives his weather forecast. Uh, we're going to have generally cloudy skies and a chance for some showers in the next couple of days. Our forecast for Atlanta and vicinity calls for tonight through Thursday and Friday to give us variable cloudiness and warm temperatures. The studio crew shifts silently on command from the control room. And somehow, the daily dog paddle is working once again. Monica and Wes wrap up the newscast. And ABC World News Tonight is next with the tales of the assassination of the former Nicaraguan president, Somoza. From ABC, this is World News. And it is over for another day. A satisfying day for most involved in this newscast, but one that was only typical in the realm of television news. It will be forgotten as the news staff starts all over again the next morning.